Hi, my name is Keith Cooper and this is a short overview of uh, three new papers or relatively new papers uh, from Permajet in the UK. Now they're one of the paper suppliers I use over here. Uh, they provide uh, ICC profiles and things like that and we'll do custom profiles if you get paper from them as well. But um, I've tested quite a lot of their papers over time. There's a few paper suppliers here in the UK I use and you will find similar uh, papers in other markets as well. Um, I will post links to the specifications and that. The specifications are, if you're looking for papers, look for very similar specifications and you will probably be close in the type of paper. Now, what are they? They're three fine art papers in their heritage range. Now, there are actually four I've got, but the fourth one is a Baraita style paper. And that I need to swap the Epson P5000 here over to Photo Black Ink. Now, it's my one remaining gripe with this, the P5000, is that it doesn't have automatic black ink swapping. So it does mean that I tend to do a load of testing and printing on one sort of paper and then switch over to the, you know, to the photo black for glossier papers. But these are art papers. They're all cotton rag, they're OBA free, so it's no brightening agents. Now, if I shine my UV pen on them, I will get a bit of glow from, but you get that from anything, it's partly from the coat but they're not got optical brightness in them, uh, which means they are a warmish white. Now they're not an obvious, what I would call natural paper, slightly warm brownish look to them. They look good and white, certainly in the lighting, lighting around here. Um, this is uh, 4000K LED lighting and there's a lamp over here has also been set for as uh, the Siri uh, lamp that I reviewed a while ago has been set for 4000K. So it's about fairly consistent lighting and the uh, monitor here is also set to 4000K, which is why hopefully stuff on here should match fairly well. But anyway, what about the papers? Um, well, they're 310 gram, all of them. Thing to remember, grams is grams per square meter. Uh, and that depends on the density of the paper. So if I look at the specifications for the paper, and this is how I put links through to this, um, yeah. um, the watercolour one, and these really just differ in surface texture is the main obvious difference. There's a watercolour, an etching, so a slightly rough and, and a smooth. So you've got three different versions and I'll show some of the results from profiling, which suggests to me that essentially you can treat them as the same. Um, I haven't tried it, but I'm minded to suggest that uh, the same profile would work for each one of them. They're that similar. Now there are actually differences, so I'd never normally recommend uh, mixing and matching profiles like that but at a push um, I think they're going to look fairly same. These are the profiling targets. Now I'm going to do a, a video uh, coming up about how I do these profiles. Um, it's using a bit of kit that I've had for quite a few years and I, I wrote a review of it a few years ago but I realised I'd never done a video of it and several people have asked me about the profiling, about what I actually do. Now I've happened to have a box of A2 sheets of this paper. So I've cut some in half for doing the initial testing. So I'm printing a target on an A3 size sheet here. Uh, that's the target for profiling using um, an I1 profiler. And then I've cut those in half to make A4 sheets and that's for black and white testing. Now I'll come back to black and white in a moment because I've got quite a few black and white sample pictures. But for the paper here, um, if I start with the, the watercolour paper, and the watercolour paper is half a millimetre thick, 310 grams. Uh, it has a whiteness, are, these are all 100% cotton papers, has a whiteness and always be wary when you look at these figures because there are lots of different ways of measuring whiteness. So you might see slightly different versions in different specifications for papers. Depends who originally made the papers. And remember, there are only a limited number of paper mills and specialised coaters out there in the world. So uh, there are going to be similarities in other countries as well. But we've got here, that's a whiteness of 90 4.9. I'm going to assume that's quite good. Uh, it doesn't specify units, of course. Now, if I go to the next one of the specifications, this is for the smooth rag. And the smooth really is quite a nice polished finish to it. There's a nice finish. 310 gram again, but only 0.44 millimetre thick. 
if you are going to be using these papers a lot and you think that your and your printer supports custom media settings and also making settings for uh, the uh, head alignment for different paper thicknesses, it's worth setting up custom media settings. So if I was going to use these papers a lot, I would have custom media settings made on the P5000 here. Quite a simple process too. I, I look at it in the reviews, but um, it just means that Everything is set up for that particular paper. Makes a difference if you're printing fine detail. Reduces any slight chance of banding. Worth doing on P700, P900 as well, and Canon printers as well. Now, I've just tested this on this P5000 pigment ink printer. I have no doubt that the papers work perfectly well were I to get the Pro 300 or Pro 200 die base printer out and do the appropriate profiling for them. They, they work well. It's a fairly standabout. This sort of paper has been around for a while. These are just a particular version of them that's been made, uh, that's been put together as a newish set. So that was the smooth rag. As I say, 93.2 brightness. Oh, it's a bit less than the watercolor. Uh, if I go on to the next one, which is the etching rag. Now this has a slightly rough surface to it, which means it's going to reflect light differently, whether it has ink on it or whether it's just the paper. And this one, the brightness goes down to 92.1. Now, once again, 92.1 watt, we don't, we don't actually know, but I'm going to assume they're the same system for each one. Once again, 100% cotton, but this one is 0.52 of a millimetre thick. So the, the slight thicknesses, although all three are 310 gram papers, they are slightly different thicknesses. Thicknesses do make a difference, particularly if you're doing bi-directional printing. So that's where the print head prints as it goes one direction and then prints as it goes back. It's faster, but because of the movement of the print head and the droplets traveling between the print head and the paper, the thickness does make a difference and the head height needs to be set. This is what happens quite a lot when you're doing, when you align, do a, a head alignment for a particular paper and set things up. You're allowing for those differences. And you're allowing for the fact it's a moving system. So if you've got the print head moving one way, the ink jets are coming out and they're traveling between the head and the paper. I know it's a very small distance, but that movement adds up and that can contribute to banding. That's one of the reasons you do all the adjustments on printers, just to fine tune them. Get them working, any new printer, get it working. And then if it has adjustments like this, do the fine tuning once you know what papers you're going to be using. It's a bit of a pain to try and do this sort of check for every single paper you might try. So it's the sort of thing you do for just your favorite papers that you like the look of. Um, these are fairly similar to papers I've used for many years for, for prints. Um, I'll show in a moment about images printed on them and why you suit the paper to your image and what you want and why it sometimes doesn't work quite so well. But anyway, that's the three papers. What about when I profiled them? And that's these targets here. Um, I scan these, measure them, create profiles. This, um, and I, I don't like the, using these uh, diagrams for, for much more than sort of just illustrative purposes, it shows the gamut volume of the papers. Um, and it shows that from a profiling point of view, they're pretty much identical. Now, I've profiled these using the USFA Ultra Smooth Fine Art setting on the printer here. There are other options, but they don't make much of a difference I found over the years. So for papers like this, I'll use the USFA. Um, there are other settings such as the Velvet Fine Art. Now, if I was doing this uh, paper, if I was trying this on an Epson 8550, for example, that has pigment black and dyes. So I'd be a bit more careful about which, about my choice. I'd use the velvet fine art, you know, the fine art uh, media setting on that because it would use the pigment black and that would get slightly better blacks when, when it works. Than, um, that. But I've covered that in the 8550 review. Um, it's why you always choose your papers after you choose the printer, not the way, uh, the way around. But anyway, that tells me that from a surface coating point of view, they're very similar. The main difference is going to be in the texture. So I can tell which they are just as I pick them up. Um, I obviously can't measure thickness precisely to a fraction of a millimeter, but this one, the watercolor one, um, certainly if I, I put the light on it, it has a rough textured surface. I can feel that is smooth 
and that one is the etching. I can just, just feel the differences between them. Visually, they don't make that much of a difference. Some images may benefit from the more textured watercolour look. Uh, quite often, watercolour papers that I've looked at in the past have been bright white papers. They've been papers for doing watercolour prints on. This really is just referring to the texture here, more heavily textured. So you can see from the three pictures here, the three uh, profiling sheets, uh, they look identical. You know, visually, there's very little difference between them. Now, for black and white, I've printed using the advanced black and white BMW print mode on this P5000 here. I would use similar on other printers as well. And here are the test images. Once again, I've got this uh, little bar at the top that I can read into the um, testing device. I've got the scanning spectrophotometer. And so this is the one I'm gonna look at in the review coming up, um, a short video of it. And here are the results for it. Now, it doesn't matter the numbers here. Um, for those of you really keen on it, I can tell you get a black D max of around about 1.6 on these. That's not terribly black, but it's on a par what you expect for an art paper. You do not use a paper like this for printing yeah, highly contrasty prints. Um, as I'll show in a bit, there, there, there are some, I've got some examples of some pictures here taken with uh, and printed uh, to look at different aspects of paper use. So there we've got that. The graph here tells me that um, we're perhaps, this paper is printed using the ABW mode on this particular printer. It's perhaps printing a little light, which means I'm not getting enough, yeah, the shadows may need, I may need a bit of adjustment. Um, but equally well, if I look at the shadow detail here, it's well defined, I'm not gonna get blocked up shadows. Um, the graph here is not a perfect one. It hints that there may be some residual color. And it's the sort that if I was looking at paper more, uh, I might even consider printing black and white with a profile. Now. Normally with pigment inks, if there's a black and white print mode, that's better, but not for every paper. Um, it does vary by paper. So uh, yes, these were printed using the ABW black and white print mode, same black and white print mode you'd use for the Canon Pro 300. Pro 200 might well look at profiles for printing black and white as well as this, but it's just the differences you get between different printers. Now this graph here also tells me there's a bit of, there's a slight bit potential for color. And certainly looking at the pictures around here under this lighting, these black and white images look relatively neutral, but under some artificial lighting, they do have a very slight magenta tinge. Now, that's something I don't associate so much with pigment ink printers, but it does happen. Certainly happens with dye ink printers of that. And if I was printing black and white on this, I might well add a very slight adjustment in the ABW settings just to offset this slight magenta tinge by dialing in a slight adjustment on the green. It's, it's a set, one of the f detail settings in the driver. Um, you have to be quite fussy to pick this sort of stuff up. Um, but with increasing use of LED lighting, um, you're likely to come across potential issues like this. So if you're unsure what a print is going to look like in a particular location and you have access to the location, do a test print, something like one of those. That's one of the, that's the free test image you can get off the North Flight site. Do a test print, take it where you're going and see what it looks like. One other hint, um, I always ask Karen to have a look at these, and that is because she has got more detailed color vision than I do. Now, where I might think, yeah, there's potential, and maybe I can see a slight color tint. If I ask her to look at it, she can see it clearly. Um, some people have better color vision than others. Uh, mine is perfectly okay, it's just hers is particularly good for fine tints and tones. Um, so uh, that picture may well be dismissed as brightly colored. Um, it's worth knowing because if picture looks good black and white to you and you sell them 
and your client happens to have better color vision than you, you could end up with them bringing the print back saying, I don't like this. I've put it up on the wall and it has a purple tinge, a green tinge. So always beware uh, that your color vision may not be as infallible as you think it is. Anyway, that's the settings up for you know, the testing I've done. What else? What about some actual prints? Well, let's take one of my classic pictures. This is one uh, taken inside Wells Cathedral, uh, the steps, Sea of Steps it's based on by F.H. Evans, um, who, who did not have such a wide angle tilt shift lens to use. Uh, this, to me, it looks okay, but I want to change the contrast a little bit. I'm not getting the sharpness in the blacks that I want. I think that this one might benefit from an adjustment curve. Now, looking at those, those curves I had recently, I was partly expecting this, but this is one of those bits where you need sometimes just to make slight adjustments to how prints come out. Now, there's that picture there. Pop that one back there. No, we won't. We'll pop it over here because it will fall down. So there's that one there. Tonality is a tricky thing to get when you're editing for black and white when you have relatively soft papers like this. There's not high contrast here. So you have to be very careful with it. I've got an image that um, I decided to print and several of these pictures were taken. I'm just testing uh, Hasselblad X2D. Uh, sorry, X1D Mark II, I should say, the 50 megapixel one. Really nice camera, just, just out take some pictures. I've got a, a short review of that coming up as well. And the picture I chose, uh, I've got several of them I've taken. There's one of the ones that was, is just over here. But this particular one shot into the sun to get the silhouette of a tree. Now, I'm not sure whether that'll look okay on the video. I'll find out when I edit the video as to how that one looks. But in most room lighting, it comes out just a bit too dark. Now I've edited this, so on the screen it looks good, but it comes out just a little too dark. Now this is something I've found sometimes printing black and white on low contrast papers. The screen gives you a slightly wrong impression of the contrast levels you're gonna get. As I said, this paper has, would probably benefit from a slight adjustment curve anyway to match up slight non-linearity with this particular printer. Uh, but what I did after a different one, and I printed it on a, at a larger size, uh, it's cropped a little bit. This one's actually printed on a watercolor paper. Um, now I'm hoping that between the two of them, there is a slight difference between them here. Uh, visually, this one is much superior to that, the tonality is better. I've pushed the blacks a little bit further and I've opened up some of the mid-tones a little bit to try and get a good looking print, not good looking on screen. Because remember, it's the print that counts. Doesn't matter how good it looks on the, on the screen. Uh, nobody's interested in what it looks like on the screen. If you're showing prints, it's the print that counts. So for those two there, I've had to do quite a few adjustments. Now, simple way of doing it, of, of lightening, um, is, this is in Photoshop, is just to apply a simple basic curve. You have the curve and just push the middle up and it just lightens everything up a little bit. Um, that's partly what I did here, but also I decided not to print it with a big border. Now this is the straight picture out of the X1D2, so it's medium format, 50 megapixels, so it's four to three format, so it doesn't quite fit on the page right. Uh, by deciding to fit it and cropping, I've gone for a more dynamic crop there. Um, I prefer this one, but once again, it's a matter of taste. Yeah, what do you like? This one is a, an afternoon out in Leicestershire countryside. It's a classic sort of winter feel to it. Now, I like that. Let's, what about colour? Well, there's a better view of what it looked like that day. So this is looking one direction down the road and this is looking the other direction, the, uh, towards the sun. So I've got a nice range of colour. This is printed on the smooth paper. Um, the smooth paper, I think if you've got fine detail, there's nothing to distract from it. 
Um, if, you want, if your image is less detailed, then go for a more textured paper. Um, I've sharpened this, I've processed this in Photoshop. Um, I've done very little to it other than just adjust the tonality, add a little bit of a curve or two to it. There's, there's very little. I've just made sure that the colour is okay in the sky. Um, I've used soft proofing in Photoshop just to get an idea of how the paper looks because you need to get a feel for papers. Now, um, I've got a couple of test images I've printed as well, of my standard test image. But what I would normally do in testing a paper, it starts off with the color profile, to, uh, yeah, the black and white, some test images, and then we'll dive into some pictures for it. Um, I've only got a few sheets of each type of this, so this is a, a relatively limited test. Um, that view there, is the same view. That has been converted to black and white. How did I do the black and white conversion? Well, for this shot here, it was a fairly basic conversion using the black and white conversion in Camera Raw, in the, in the raw image processing. I've produced black and white image. Um, I think, well, that looks, I've altered the tonality of it a little bit, just to slide as a bit, but I've got an image I'm fairly happy with. With this particular one over here, and there we go, there's the image there. With that image, what I've done is I've converted it using Nick Silver Effects, which is great for black and white conversions. I've also converted on another layer, the original image, just using a plain grayscale conversion in Photoshop, using the various sliders you could get for that. I've then blended the two together. Why have I done this? Because I often find that you do a conversion, you may slightly overdo it a little bit, the, the tonality of it, bringing up the contrast. And then if you then blend that with the original or blend it with a, a, a basic version, it just drops it back a little bit. So I always find from editing in Photoshop that it is far easier to over adjust and then drop back to what you want than it is to try and edge up to what you think is right because you just keep, you're never quite right. If you do it to a point where you think, I've overdone that. So the curve, for example, that I showed earlier that I've added too much. Okay, I've done that, now let's just drop back a bit. Um, if you're still unsure, go away, have a walk around outside the office, come back, have a look at it afresh. Um, look for that initial reaction, what you think about it. So there we've got that one there. The, I mean, the colour image itself is a nice looking picture. It's come out, it's nice tonality in it. I say, there's the print, there's the view on the screen. Um, another shot, this taken an indoor shot. There we go, De Montfort University. Now, anyone who's seen my reviews of tilt shift lenses and the likes will recognize the place. It's uh, not far from here. Um, this is an example of a picture I might not necessarily think initially of printing on a matte paper like this. Um, I wanted to see how it came out. It looks, I'm going to say, surprisingly good. Why surprisingly so? Because this is a classic picture I would have looked to print out on a luster paper, something like this one here. That's a Baraita style paper. Um, I would print this on a paper like that. Um, but it doesn't look bad. And it just goes to show that you need to experiment a bit with your papers to decide what's what, what looks best. So there we've got it. Um, three different not that different papers um, and how you go about doing prints, uh, the process I go through, how I do a quick test of a paper. Now, if I had um, ideally, my, my ideal size for testing paper is A3 plus uh, because it doesn't seem nearly so profligate in ink in turning out test prints and things like this. Now I could cut it in half to A3 and, uh, and that would be okay. But you don't have to, if you want to test a new paper, A4 is more than enough or letter in the US. Um, so there you have it. Uh, that's the three cotton rag art papers in the heritage rag from Permajet. Um, yeah, they look 
fine. I don't have a problem with them. In fact, some of them look rather nice. Now, I hope that's useful. Please do ask questions. Check the links as well on the video because I'll add some more information there. I'll put links to the uh, the forms, yeah, the details of the papers and that so you can explore it a bit more. And I will, when I've changed the printer over, I'll have a look at the Baraita paper as well. And I may well come back and see whether I was right in thinking that this picture would have a bit more impact on a Baraita paper than this, the smooth. Oh. Nothing wrong with this, but you just have to be careful with how you pick your papers and stuff. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel. Uh, appreciate it if you do. And um, thanks.